Everybody, my name is Dunaberry and I have Stephen Butler here beside me as well and this is the, the breeding and reproduction stand and probably never more so than, than now there's a real complementarity between breeding um, animal, animal breeding and uh, these reproductive technologies. So I'm just going to do the first half of the board and um, Stephen will do the other half. It doesn't look like there's anybody coming after us so we can take our time and yeah. opportunity for plenty of questions afterwards, okay? Um, so I want to start off here on the, on the top. Uh, top left from what you're looking at and what I'm showing here in red is the, the EBI, the Economic Breeding Index, the average EBI of our dairy herd over the last 20 years. Actually the EBI is 20 years old this year. Inside in the, the black is the milk sub-index part of it and the green is the fertility sub-index part of it. Now there's a few points I want you to take from this um, and a lot of this would be what I've, what I've heard commentary wise going to discussion groups. Firstly there is no apparent uh, deceleration in the rate of genetic gain for EBI. Many people were saying to me, EBI is going up, can it keep going up? Is it starting to slow down? Absolutely no sign of it starting to slow down and no actual reason why it should slow down when we look at genetics theory. The second point that often comes across my desk is our oh, EBI is driven predominantly by fertility. That's the only reason that, that EBI is going up. If we look at the green line, the fertility line and the milk line, the, the milk sub-index line, they're actually going up at more or less exactly the same pace. If anything, probably the milk sub-index is going up faster. So it's completely untrue that it's the fertility sub-index only that's driving the EBI. It is the both sub-indexes as, as well as, as the, the rest of it. And then finally, if we look at what has happened over that 20 year uh, time horizon that the EBI was in existence, the EBI today is around 140 euros greater than what it was 20 years ago. So from a profit per lactation perspective, that's worth around 280 euros more profit per lactation. Right, if you look at the average uh, milk yield of dairy cows, that's around 5.3 cent per litre. So it's a phenomenal gain that has been achieved over the past 20 years and the beauty of breeding as opposed to other strategies like nutrition is that even if you took your eyes off the ball for the next few years, you will keep that genetic gain going. That genetic gain is going up at around 10 euros per year. Right? So what is it doing? Well, it's, 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 it's the, the EBI is delivering on, on multiple fronts. So a greater milk solids yield. So if we compare ourselves today to what we were 20 years ago, our cows are now yielding 21% more milk solids per lactation. Half of that roughly would actually be due to genetics. We're getting longer lactation, so our median calving date has been pulled back. It's come back around eight days over the past few years. It's now around the 23rd of February is our median calving date. And that's enabling us to get longer lactation, to get closer and closer to that three or five days. Our median lactation length is around 279 days at the moment. So we are losing around 4% yields per lactation by not getting the three or five days. Greater survival. Um, you, you'll see it um, at the ICBF board, so our six-week calving rate is, is, is going up. It's gone up around 12% in the past few years. It's still only around 67%. So yes, we are getting better, but we're still far below our target of around 90%, and, and Stephen will touch on that in a second as well. But the number of lactations we are achieving is going up around 0.1 every two years. So within a 20-year time frame, then we should be getting closer to uh, one more lactation. Currently, our national average is around 4.65 lactations achieved per cow, where our goal would be 5.5 lactations per cow. And the EBI, the Economic Breeding Index, as the name suggests, is economic-based. Right? And we've had evidence from more Park over the past several decades, uh, Lines as a State, uh, from UCD, the National Database, it's all quite clearly showing us, just irrespective of the system, um, higher EBI animals lead to more profit. And you'd be probably mostly be well familiar with the next generation herd. Again, we're going to see more of it in, in the village, but here they have the, the national average EBI compared to the top 3% uh, on EBI. If we look at the profit per lactation, 2,500 euros profit per lactation from the, the elite compared to uh, 1,600. So 50% um, improvement in profitability. But that's the economic side of things. What you haven't seen before, because this is new stuff, is the, the improvement in environmental efficiency. And if we compare, for example, how much carbon, so this carbon dioxide thing, how much carbon is produced for fast corrected milk, we can see that it's 12% better in these elite animals, even though we actually haven't directly been selecting for improved environmental efficiency. Ben the Hart's work again is showing from a nitrogen use efficiency and, and the lads would have been talking about nitrogen use efficiency and Mick is going to talk about it and, and Mike Egan in the next board. We can again see that these higher EBI animals are more nitrogen uh, efficient. Right? So a, a, a huge cumulative benefit from, from selecting on the EBI. 
Then finally, I want to finish off with the dairy beef index. Uh, again, we're going to hear a lot about it today. There's a, there's a, a village on it, uh, and Stephen's going to touch on how the reproductive technologies can enable us to better use beef within the dairy herd. So two years ago, we launched an index just like the EBI. It's called the DBI, the Dairy Beef Index. And what we're trying to do with the Dairy Beef Index is identify beef bulls for use on dairy females, heifers and cows, right? And to do that, you want to marry kind of the desires of the dairy farmer, which is obviously short gestation, easy calving and a live calf, with that of a beef farmer who wants a bit of growth, muscle and good efficiency. So if we look at the relative emphasis on those traits within the, the dairy beef index, we can see here the, the black is calf difficulty, the red is gestation. So around half of the emphasis is put on the desires of the dairy farmer and the remaining half then is put on the desires of the beef farmer, that the bigger, faster growing uh, animal. However, like the EBI, especially in the younger days, what you can have is you can have bulls who excel in one of those suites of traits. So for example, is, is super and carcass conformation, but can also be difficult calving. But that's, that the, the excellence in conformation uh, overrides the, the calving difficulty. So it's important that you just go, don't go in willy-nilly and pick bulls that are higher on DBI, that you actually tailor your selection. So for example, on heifers, you'll be choosing easy calving bulls. Um, and then depending on where you are in the breeding season, you might be putting more emphasis on gestation rate. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Stephen, and Stephen's going to take the, the second half of the board. And we can take questions then at the end. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Donat. So I'm going to talk now about the technologies that we can use to, to, to realize that genetic gain. So as you, you're likely aware, uh, in the next few weeks here, Sexing Technologies will be setting up a lab here in Moorpark to produce sex semen. And that semen will be available for sale in the spring of 2022. This is really important because it's going to increase the team of bulls that are available and also likely the, the EBI of that team of bulls that are available. So now we can look at sex semen as a real strategy to increase genetic gain in the herd. So, so how do we do that? If you were to look at your herd, and this is all your cows and all your heifers, and you were to look at their EBI, this is showing you the average here. So, so the, the, the poorest EBI are down here, the best EBI are up here, and this is the average, and you can see that most of your animals are somewhere around the mean. But what you want to do from a genetic gain perspective is to only use the very best stems, and here I'm just showing the best half, so the top half based on EBI, they're all allocated for breeding with sex semen. So that means from day one of the breeding season, you have other animals that are not going to get inseminated with dairy semen. So from day one of the breeding season, half the animals in this example are allocated to get beef semen. So high DBI beef semen. We've done a number of field trials in the last few years with this Sex Ultra 4M product, and one of the trials was insemination after observed heat. So you can see here with conventional semen, the average pregnancy rate was 60%. With sex semen, it was 50%. We did a follow-up trial with fixed time AI, and on average, conventional was 61%, sex semen was 50.2%. 50, 50 so, so in both those studies, it didn't really matter if you used a fixed time AI protocol or observed heat, albeit using fixed time AI does mitigate some of the risk of poor fertility because all your inseminations are on day one of the breeding season. But it doesn't matter in terms of uh, pregnancy rate. So in both of those studies, sex semen was about 84% as good as conventional. Now, that's where the cows are all matched. So the same cows that got conventional, the cows that got conventional semen were the same as the cows that got sex, based on parity, days in milk, so on. So we've learned that these are things that matter though. So parity, days in milk, body condition score, the EBI, these are all things that really matter in terms of the conception rate you're going to achieve with sex semen. So when you target it, you're going to be targeting those animals. And there's a board in the breeding and reproduction village that uh, a large survey of about 330 herds about 10,000 inseminations, and when you look at it, when you target the, the sex semen towards more fertile animals, the gap between sex and conventional is now only about 4%. And in that scenario, sex semen was 93% as good as conventional. So it's at that stage now where it's, it's become a mainstream product, and it can be reliably used to, to, to generate replacements and accelerate genetic gain. The other big advantage, of course, is the effect it's going to have on the calf crop. If you look at the statistics in Ireland for 2020, which is the last year where there's complete statistics, statistics available, this is the calf crop from the dairy herd. 27% were female dairy calves, 27% were male dairy calves. This go hand in hand. If you use conventional dairy semen to generate replacements, you get the exact same number of male dairy calves that are, that are hard to move up the farm. And the remaining 46% then were, were beef cross. So that's a combination of beef AI plus also uh, natural service. Now, if you, were to, if you were to use sex semen to generate the same number of female dairy replacements, the consequent number of male dairy calves is now down to somewhere between 2 and 
allowing more DBI semen to be used or more beef natural service at the very end of the breeding season, resulting in 70% of the calf crop being beef cross. So 70% and 27%, these are all calves that, are, that you want to either retain as replacements or they're much easier to, to move off the farm um, at, at 14 days of age. So if we were to think into the future here about some new technologies we're going to require, if we're using sex semen, and in particular, if we're using sex semen on the best dams, the highest DBI dams, we're going to have fewer male dairy calves. That's a good thing for the industry, more sustainable calf crop. But it's also going to mean fewer male dairy calves that are potentially available or coming on stream to be used as AI bulls. There's going to be fewer of them. Um, so so what we, we need to think about a strategy to generate the next generation of future AI bulls and a strategy to, to maintain that genetic gain, keep, keep driving that forward. And what we'd like to do is have multiple matings with elite merit donors. So the very top end of the, 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 the cows in the country, few potential bull dams, to have multiple matings with them. And potentially with, with multiple different sires, maximizing the chance of, uh, of, of producing a high genetic merit bull that's potentially going to be suitable for, it, for use in AI. So this year we, we did a, a trial to evaluate a, a technology, I guess, that's become mature in that it's, it's something that that's, that's can be used now in a, in a, in a meaningful way uh, to achieve genetic gain. So this involves oocyte collection. So take your elite donors, elite cows, elite heifers, and every week these are scheduled for oocyte collection. These oocytes then are brought to a lab and we, get, we conduct in vitro fertilization, IVF. Everybody's familiar with this from the, from the human field. Uh, and then th after fertilization, there's an embryo produced and that's cultured for about seven days. So seven days of producing that or growing that embryo in a lab environment. And after seven days, the good embryos are selected and they're transferred back into recipients, cows or heifers that are also synchronized to be on day seven of their cycle. So there's a bit of organizing involved in this, but the, the big advantage is that you can have lots of matings between cows that are elite and bulls that are elite within the same breeding season. Um, when, when these embryos are transferred fresh, certainly for dairy, elite dairy, the pregnancy rates were similar to AI. Okay, so this, this tells you straight away that this is something that is now potentially viable, could be used to, to achieve genetic gain on dairy farms. Another thing we're looking at, and, and we don't have answers to this yet, is to, to, to try and produce lower cost beef embryos. So these are eggs collected from beef heifers after slaughter go through the same process of fertilization and culture and transfer back into cows that you don't want replacements from. And the advantage here is that your, 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 your calf that's born now is somewhere close to 100% beef breed genetics. And what are the implications of that for the, the growth rate, the carcass value, the days to slaughter, days to finish, all of these phenotypes that are critical for the beef men, that, that's, that's the objective of the study is to look at that. So the take home messages from this board, I mean, as Donna clearly outlined, it's important that we all continue to use DBI. I mean, this has is, this is given a lot of economic gains and into the future environmental gains. Um, use high EBI sex semen for replacements. And again, this is something that maybe five years ago wasn't suitable for everybody, but just, just the way things have changed and the fact that more bulls are going to be available, better EBI bulls are going to be available, this is now something that's, 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 that's become mainstream. Uh, we haven't really mentioned it here, but, but high EBI crossbreeding can increase performance. Donna mentioned heterosis. This is obviously uh, something that, 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 that can give a lot of gains for, for farms, especially where you're starting with a, with a poor EBI. Use the DBI to generate the non-replacements. Calculate the figure in terms of number of replacements you require, and all of the other inseminations then should be using uh, DBI. And as I've outlined up here, you know, we are doing some studies to look at the, the role of reproductive technologies and what they can potentially deliver in the future.